Our next guest is a homie, Cam Meller of College Football Network, newly formed, formerly with Pro Football Network. We'll dive into that later. But Cam, welcome back to the show, man. I appreciate you guys having me. I, I'm, I'm always uh, happy to be a friend, but now that I'm elevated to, to homie status, I'm even happier. Hey, and you got the mug. So, uh, yeah, the swag, right? you got you know the what? swag, you got everything. I'm not going to lie. This thing's like not left my hands since I've got it. So <laughs> it's perfect. At least we know it's being used. Right. Absolutely. That, everything so far. So, uh, you know, 10 for 10 that box was. So I appreciate it. Uh, again, keep elevating. That's my goal. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the guys we've talked about. And let's start with the fresh news of the day, which is Blake Freeland uh, going to the uh, NFL. What are his prospects, in your opinion? Because I know there's been a lot of first-round possibility with him. Yeah, so I think what happened is a couple of dominoes fell with this offensive tackle class. You had Fashanu from Penn State, largely seen as the guy who could push Paris Johnson uh, from Ohio State for the number one tackle overall. He shocks everybody by returning to school. Uh, whatever his decisions and his reasons are, I know he was you know new to starting, and so he's got his he's he's OT one next year. We can just say that at this point. I think then you look at it, you have a guy like Paris Johnson who then is the de facto one. I think the, those dominoes start to fall. You look at the rest of the tackles that are seen as potential day two guys. Say, hey, wow, I could really vault myself up into those first thirty one picks this year, and I think you know that's the situation with Blake right there. You know, he's a guy who could vault himself up into the thirty four top thirty one picks. The senior bowl is going to do a lot for him, I think. Um, you know, just prove he's healthy, prove he can, can you know, do do his thing against the best, uh, the best of the best. And I think he can maybe potentially get himself there. But that long shot or worst case scenario, he's still at day two, firmly in that early stages of round two, round three. Well, one of the guys that was extremely happy for the play of Blake Freeland and everybody in front of him was quarterback Jaron Hall. And, you know, Cam, it, it's interesting. I've, I've seen such a wide range of where people think Jaron Hall may go. What's your opinion on his draft stock? It's it's tough. You know, it's you want to say he has all the intangibles and tools to, to be a first-round quarterback. But there's no denying that. The age is going to be a hindrance for him as well, unfortunately. You know, they want guys who they can get in super young, mold them, and, and allow them to learn and grow with the program. Jaron's got to be ready to go from the get-go, from day one. So I think for him right now, he is absolutely drafted. He's going to have a GM and an entire front office staff fall in love with him once uh, they meet with him and, and get him in rooms and interviews and, and, and all the, the pre-draft process, process that goes on. But for him, the senior bowl is crucial, is key. He needs to showcase he can not only pick up the playbook on that first day of practice, but when he's interviewed and talked to with the staff members, with the scouts, with the eight, everybody that he's going to be around at the senior bowl, that whole week in Mobile, is crucial for him. It's not just what we see on field and, and on, on film from the NFL Network. It's it's every day that he is there, the minutia, every moment that he's there, proving that he's ready to go, ready to lead an NFL team because he's going to be asked to do so early in his career. We're talking to Cam Miller of the College Football Network. Hey, I'm hoping Jaron gets picked up by the Seahawks uh, at some point, you know, four, fourth, fifth round, re-sign Geno. Let's keep this going. Um, let's talk <laughs> about other guys as well who might be in the mix. Those two will be drafted, you'd think. Um, anybody else who will be drafted? Puka Nakua certainly sticks out. Uh, a guy like Christopher Brooks, perhaps. Who who else is in the mix? Yeah, Brooks, to me, made himself in the mix. He, he was down there in Orlando at the Hula Bowl. He did exactly what he needed to do. He put on a show with every carry, hard-nosed guy, big guy who could move. But to me, Puka Nakua, I think he might eventually, as we get through January into March, and when he gets to run at the Combine, he's going to be a guy who could be drafted higher than Jared. I think at this point, I think you have mm. no one's going to know who he is, really the injuries and he didn't put up a full season that people want to talk about. The guy is as fast as they come, as talented as they come. I don't need to tell you guys there or the entire uh, the city of Provo there how talented he is. And I just think that his pre-draft process from the senior bowl all the way through to a pro day to the combine, uh, he's going to be a guy that turns heads and people are going to have the, the they develop their draft crushes on. So I think the cool who could jump stuff and maybe right there ahead of Jared, depending on how they both perform at the senior bowl. Staying with Puka, how do you think his game translates to the NFL? How does he stack up against the other guys that will be in the mix at that position looking to get drafted? He'll be ready right away because he's got what I call natural separation ability. He uses his speed, but he uses his speed in the play. His play speed much better than most I've seen when he's healthy. He's a guy who, you know, he can create separation of the line of scrimmage with the burst that he has. He also can create that on his route breaks across any route and in any depth of the field. And so to me, he's a guy, if you look at a Chris Olave who came in and was ready to go from the, the opening snap with the Saints this past year, you know, that's a similar player, super fast, super twitchy, I think is the, the proper draft term to use. 
that's Puka. And so I think for him, he's going to be ready to go as early as, uh, you know, week one of his rookie season. And that's uh, that's a, one of the major factors he'll have going for him. Cam, you're so hip with the lingo. You, you know, you talk like the kids right. talk these days. We like it. You know, I, I could talk in meme language. I, I don't know if I get it all accurate 100% of the time, but at least, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to stay hip. If you can communicate in all emojis, that's when you're an elite texter. But that's another conversation. Um, yeah, any, continue to elevate. Anybody, <laughs> elevation, let's go. You too. Great, uh, great song in 01. What, um, what other guys, if any, are in the mix? Or are these the four we're looking at in the NFL draft from BYU this year? To me, that's the four. I think, you know, Chris Brooks did himself a huge favor at the Hula Bowl to get himself there. I think the three you have to hang your hat on are the three we've talked about now. It's not quite like a year ago or even, you know, with high projections for some players, the transfer portal and obviously uh, NIL deals are keeping players and pushing players elsewhere. So uh, the offensive line could get one. Joe Tugawa, who, excuse me, could, uh, could see himself there as well. But I think with Connor Pave returning, he was the next guy for me as well. So that's sort of the the headliner of the 2024 class that's uh, returning to Provo. Harris Lachance, uh, the starting right tackle, does he have a shot in your opinion? Long shot. I think right now probably a preferred walk-on. He's going to have to test well um, and, and hopefully have somebody fall in love with his size and his movement ability. Uh, right tackle is not quite as coveted in the NFL nowadays uh, as left tackles would be, unfortunately. So, And also it's a very stacked right tackle class. So you have Darnell Wright from Tennessee up there, Dewan Jones from OSU. Uh, who are going to command the right tackle attention. And then from there, it's, it's you know, a long shot for most of these right tackles. Cam, BYU's on a nice little run with quarterbacks. Obviously, you know what happened with Zach Wilson, and now obviously we expect Jaron Hall to be drafted. The next guy up is Keaton Slovis, and we certainly know the hype around Slovis when he was at USC. He's now a couple of places removed. He comes in here to Provo. First off, what did you make of him coming to BYU, and what, do, do his prospects look like with a good season uh, heading into the draft next season? I just think it states a lot about the program and where Coach Satake has built the program. To, to have a guy like Keaton Slovis say what you will about 2022 with Pittsburgh, that was not the same offense that he, I think, committed to originally. Everything changed, and it was a very unique situation there in Pittsburgh when you run the ball you know, almost twice as much as you throw it. Uh, and you're asked to do very little in the passing game, you can't do too much. So credit to to the BYU program as a whole for building themselves up into a school that says, hey, we're a quarterback-friendly program right now. We're going to get you drafted, and we're going to vault your draft stock. And I think that's got to be the biggest reason why Keaton has decided to come to, to BYU. I, I know there's a, you know, a familiarity with him and, and where he trains in the offseason as well, but to me, this is the the program that can put you on a map for a one year. And, you know, kudos to to Lonnie for you know adjusting and evolving to the new age of football where you have to be willing to do the one and done at certain positions uh, and so that's what Slovis says they one and done and BYU is exactly the place he can do he can come showcase some of that talent that he has in his right arm uh, you know throw some receivers open hit some deep shots down the field be one and done and, and vault himself back up into uh, you know a day two kind of kid right away. You're always hoping to continue its string of running backs as well to the NFL which has been pretty successful here with Jamal Williams and, and Tyson Williams and Tyler Algier and perhaps Christopher Brooks. Um, Aiden Robbins comes from Louisville and then 1,000 yards with UNLV. What are you seeing from the six foot three, 230 pounder that could be great news for BYU this upcoming season? Yeah, if you thought Chris Brooks was big and had great balance <laughs> and speed for a man that's size, wait until you see Aiden Robbins. <laughs> this is guy, I don't know how he didn't get looks at Louisville for three years he was there. But there's a reason he was, you know, an ACC running back, a power five running back back before BYU was power five. So to me, again, a testament to where the program has been built over the past few years, a testament to evolving to the transfer portal. But then you have Robbins. I mean, this is a kid who I want to see him sort of contribute out of the backfield in the in the passing game. But that's not his uh, his MO right now. His MO is running people over uh, with his size, with the, the contact balance. And those are skills that translate from college football to the NFL right away. So I, I liken him sort of to like a Javante Williams, but a lot bigger, you know, with the Broncos from UNC. So Robbins right now has very high ceiling um, and just a very low floor in the sense, or a very high floor in the sense that he's a guy who will be drafted as well, uh, just based on physical traits alone. But uh, if he can vault himself up with, with another great season, another thousand on year. So let's stay with the, the upcoming season and beyond. Obviously, we've mentioned Keaton Slovis and Aiden Robbins. 
Anybody else on, on the roster that will be draft eligible after this year standing out to you now? Or Because, look, you've always been really good at like, hey, I, like, I, I see this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to predict this, and a lot of this stuff has come true. Anybody on your radar for that? I really I, – so I'll stick with the transfer portal because it, to pull both Boise State defensive linemen – namely Jackson Cravens. This is a guy, again, power five guy from, from before transfers, and here we are with a second destination. Uh, a guy of his stature on the inside that can play nose but also shift outside to as far out as three, five, maybe even some seven tech outside. So to me, the guy with his size, his potential, you know, question marks last year going into the year were, were can BYU rush the passer? But not this year. We're going to go into this year with – a stacked defensive line and, and Cravens and then Dagna as well from, from Boise State. Those two, I think, can vault themselves into not just draft potential, but guys that people are going to fall in love with uh, in the sense that uh, Cravens specifically, his versatility across the defensive line should get him coveted and, hi and high round looks, you know, day two for him if it all goes to plan. That's music to all of our ears because we're hoping for better defensive line play from BYU. Obviously, more pressure. There's more risk there, but uh, it'll certainly be a different flavor of BYU defense. With BYU going into the Big 12, certainly fans are hoping and expecting that recruiting continues to elevate. BYU is unique. It wants members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and other talented people. It has uh, access to a certain type of player that perhaps no one else does uh, in a unique way. What kind of elevation do you anticipate potentially for BYU being in the Big 12 in that others who aren't necessarily looking at BYU in the first place may consider BYU now that they are Power 5? Yeah, they're going to see them on the national stage, right? They're going to see them against the, the, the programs that everybody knows and are synonymous with college football against the Texas Longhorns. Intercepting Quinn Ewers is going to get a defensive back to say, well, hey, maybe I can go be a Cougar. Maybe I can go live in the beautiful scenery that is – BYU, they're going to be able to see the Bell Edwards Stadium. They're going to be able to see the, the facilities a lot easier than it is to say, hey, you know, hear Coach Satake on the phone and say, hey, come, come visit me in Provo, Utah. It's a little bit different when you see it on field. So I will say to fans, probably a cautionary tale to uh, be warned, recruiting usually takes about a year, two years to catch up to where you are today. And so it might not happen right away. It might not happen overnight. Give the staff time, give the program time. You know, there will be a large adjustment period, but it's going to eventually elevate since that's the theme of the, 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 the talk today. It will elevate. It'll, it just may take some time. But uh, once there's the fans and recruits and parents specifically, once those eyes have been opened, it, it will elevate with, with the program. When Jerem introduced you, Cam, he mentioned the College Football Network. That's a, a new venture for you. Tell us about it. It's college football all the time. Uh, you know, not very many do it across the country, uh, if any, to cover all 131 teams evenly. You know, you hear about the top five, the top six, the perennial powerhouses and college football network is, is taking it to the next level in which we give every program across the country an equal share, a fair share. We're a small outfit, but we're doing it right. And we're going to, you know, stand by the programs and the players themselves to help elevate their platforms. So, I appreciate you guys giving me time to, to discuss it. Um, and, you know, it's it's where you can find full coverage on all 131 teams, not just those top five you're, uh, we're all sick of hearing about. Well, now we're going to be snooty and Power 5 friendly. So, uh, no, <laughs> no, it's going to be awesome to uh, check out the work. You've always really known BYU as well. We appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the insight. Great stuff. It's my pleasure, as always. Thanks for having me. Uh, look forward to being back as a homie level status and whatever we can figure out is the next level up. It's a new level. Absolutely. Enjoy, enjoy that. Yeah, we, oh, look at that. <laughs> Great product placement. Got to. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. I, I wasn't paid for this, I promise. <laughs>